Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word this morning, we pray that you would help us to understand what Titus was saying to the people in Crete and that we might be able to take from what he said the lessons that apply to us in this day and age. Amen. Crete was an interesting place. The people in Crete had their own set of gods and the head god there was Zeus and as Andrew told us a few weeks ago, Zeus was apparently a man who somehow or other got elevated to be a god and he was a god who was into sex and all that sort of stuff and he was quite happy to tell lies so that he could get on to all the women that he was interested in. And that was because the people were worshipping a god like that, they took on those same godly attitudes, if you like, the attitude of, the, of that god, which was certainly not a very nice sort of a, an attitude. And so Cretans got a reputation that they were always liars, they were evil brutes and lazy gluttons. Now why do people tell lies? When you think about it, why do you usually tell lies? Why do kids tell you lies? Come on. To say it's it so they don't get punished like they should. Then why do politicians tell lies? So that they can be elected. <laughs> now you giggle. <clears throat> I was reading a, a sermon of Spurgeon as I prepared for this and he was saying that when they're out looking for votes, the politicians tell lies and when they get elected, of course, they don't carry out the things they were going to carry out. And he also noted that in the courts of that time, lies were flying here, there and everywhere. The king was even telling lies. Look, really, when you read it, it could have been writing, telling us about today. People tell lies to get something that they shouldn't have. It might be money, it might be status, it might be to get into a position of power. It might be to avoid punishment. But the people in Crete were very accomplished liars. At the start of Paul's letters, letter to Titus, Paul stresses that God the Father does not lie, and that God can be relied upon to keep his promises. Paul warned Titus about false teachers who was spreading lies amongst the Christians and in that way he was creating, they were creating havoc and harming the church in Crete. Now apparently they were telling the lies so that they would end up financially well off. Now Paul goes on to tell Titus to teach different church members how to behave for the good of their families as well as the church. And so in chapter 2 we read, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. <coughs> Excuse me. Now a sound body is one in which all the limbs and organs work as they were intended to work. And for the young people, as we get older, we find that our bodies become less sound because they don't always work the way that they were originally intended. Sound doctrine is all the doctrine taught by the apostles as they had received it from Jesus. We've got to remember that the apostles were eyewitnesses of Jesus' life. Today we have that doctrine set out in the New Testament. I could tell you the gospel in half a page and do it quite well. But the New Testament is a lot thicker than half a page. That's because there is lots of other stuff that helps us to live as Christians 
and to live lives that are honouring to God. And all of that stuff is important. Jesus said that the Old Testament is still true, that there's nothing wrong in there, and so we have the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. There's a lot more in there than just saying that God created us, God loves us, and God sent Jesus to save us. And so it's all the doctrine that needs to be taught and learned. Now, verse 2, we find, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. The older men need special advice and encouragement. Now, Chrysostom, who was one of the early Christian teachers, observed that there are some failings which age has that youth has not. Some indeed it has in common with youth, but in addition it has a slowness, a timidity, a forgetfulness, an insensibility and an irritability. Now I can even recognise quite a few of those things in my life and Margaret could identify a lot more, I'm sure. As you get older, you tend to become a grumpy old man. But older men, so the older men are not naturally good examples to follow. Titus was to teach the older men to be temperate, not heavy drinkers. They were to be worthy of respect and self-controlled. That is, that they were to show a dignity which is appropriate to their seniority and because they're senior, they should have heard a lot of teaching in the church and understand the doctrine a lot better than new Christians. And um, that dignity is also a reflection of their inner self-control. Secondly, older men are expected to be sound or mature in every aspect of their character, especially their faith as they fully trust God, in their love as they serve others. And Steve gave us some beautiful examples of older men serving him. And in endurance as they wait patiently for the return of Christ. They were to be good examples, men who could be trusted to give good advice, supporters of their local ministers, instead of being like the typical Cretan old men who wasted their time in lazing around, pandering to their selfish desires. The modern day selfish old man retires from productive work and proceeds to become a grey nomad, go fishing, spend his day in the bar of a club or pub, or find some other way to waste his time and financial resources. But Christians are to continue to serve God. Some of them do go out as grey nomads, and what they do is they tour around Australia, and when they go to BCA places, Bush Church Aid Society towns, they help restore the church because it's usually falling down. They tend to paint out the vicarage for the minister there because he hasn't got time to do it and they help in that way. Our church here, the last time it got painted, was painted by um, a group of people who were virtually grey nomads and they came up here and painted it because we didn't have the time to do it. So you can move around but still serve God. Then we go on to verses 3 and start of 4. Likewise teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children. The godly older women were to have the responsibility of teaching the younger women how to be successful wives, mothers and housekeepers. 
and the younger women have the responsibility of listening and obeying. I'm sorry, I jumped the paragraph. The older women were to live godly lives, allowing their sense of God's presence to permeate, to spread right through their whole lives. They're not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine. In a culture where the women would gather at the communal water point in the cool of the day to fill their jugs and then drag them home, it was easy to be caught up in the latest gossip. Fake news is easily confused with true news. Character assassination or slander can easily follow. Today, we usually have a water supply to every house, but it is very easy to spend too much time on social media. That's not just those fancy phones where the pictures fly here, there and everywhere, and that they have Facebook and Twitter and other stuff like that, but social media includes the telephones that you use to talk between people socially. And through that we find out what others are doing. Like the older men, they were to be temperate in their use of alcohol. Instead of using their tongues for slander, they were to use them to teach what is good. So they not only teach their own children and grandchildren, but also they're given the task of teaching the younger women. If Titus was a single man, or even if he was married, we don't know which, Teaching the younger women would have left him open to accusations, just as modern ministers have to be very careful to avoid being found in compromising situations. Now, it's not just ministers. Teachers have the same sort of thing. And I can remember at the high school when all of this started to become apparent that we made changes. The principal used to leave the office door open when he was talking to people so that anybody walking past could see what was going on in his office. Now, at the time, he had a very loud voice so they could hear what was going on too. Um, the school counsellor rearranged the office, put a window in the door, and had the people who the school counsellor was talking to sitting on the w with their backs to the wall where the door was so that people going past couldn't see who he was talking to, but the council was on the other side of the room, so people walking past could see what the councillor was doing. The careers advisor had a room that didn't have any windows onto a corridor or anything like that. So he just opened the door, put his desk out in the corridor and used to interview people there. Always careful to avoid situations where people could tell stories, true or false. So having godly older women doing the teaching of the young ones is a much safer practice for the ministers. Now as these older women taught the younger ones, the younger ones were to find out just what they should be doing. Now in our congregations, we have women in this situation. Some of them teach scripture in schools, along with a lot of younger ones. Some support people who are struggling in their lives. They do parish visiting, if you like. I see in this church some young women who value the support and advice from older women. These older women have been there and done that before the young ones, and they've made mistakes and learnt from them, and if the young ones learn from the older women, then they don't have to suffer the same mistakes. The Christian home was a totally new concept in Crete, and young women saved out of pagan practices would have to get accustomed to a whole new set of priorities and privileges. Then as now, those who had unsaved husbands would need special encouragement. If a wife loved her husband and her children, she was well on the way to making the marriage a success. In Crete, as in many other countries, marriages were less than romantic. 
Often it was only after the marriage that the partners had to learn to love each other. And the same Greek word for love is used here in relation to both husband and children. So the sort of love here is self-sacrificial love. The young women had sacrificed themselves in serving their families. Now we see this go wrong in some situations where we see the kids left at home while the parents head off to the club and the kids may not be supervised because they haven't got an adequate babysitter. We hear it on the news now and again down in Sydney where they find kids in cars while the parents are either in the club or in a, in a casino gambling away. They're living the way they lived before they had a family instead of changing and loving their family properly. In being self-controlled and pure, the young women who are self-controlled are in the best position to discipline their kids when required. In Crete, it was usually up to the father to discipline the children, but the mother still needed to back up her husband when the children headed for mum to avoid the discipline. Now, that still happens today, doesn't it, as kids try to play parents off against each other. And the parents need to be self-controlled and work together. A Christian wife was to be true to her husband in mind and heart, as well as in action. To be busy at home implies taking on the management of the household rather than neglecting the family. It didn't mean that they had to stay in the house 24-7, but they were meant to organise it and run it. There's still room for the young women to show kindness in their actions, and kind young women are very appealing people and lots of people find that great. To be subject to their husbands does not imply any idea of women being inferior, but rather they're to allow their husbands to take on the duty of headship in the home. And this means that the husbands need to take on the responsibility and care of the family, following the example of Jesus, who went to the extent of dying on the cross to save his family, the Christian church. There's no other way that God's children can be saved from the consequences of their disobedience to God. And that's why Jesus had to die. Now, one of the reasons that young women are asked to be subject to their husbands is that no one will malign the word of God. Christian marriages and Christian homes beautifully commend the gospel. Those which fall short of this ideal bring the gospel into disrepute. So that in that sort of um, society that they had in Crete, a Christian home really looked much different to the normal Cretan home. And we find missionaries saying this in Southeast Asia and other places, that when the outsiders come into the homes of the missionaries, it's a whole different ball game. They find husbands that love their wives, wives that love their husbands, and the way in which the family runs, it's a great witness to these people from outside the church. And they think, hang on, here is a great family and we'd like to have a family that operates this way. And so it's one of the things that attracts people to finding out more about Jesus. <clears throat> now in each case, self-control was to be expected from all God's people. And it takes self-control to avoid all the non-Christian behaviours and attractions that are seen in a non-Christian society. In our society, people try to escape from the disappointments of life by handing over control of their lives 
to alcohol and other recreational drugs. And this allows the people to avoid confronting their dissatisfaction of living shallow lives which do not bring them lasting peace and satisfaction. Now, because Christians have something ahead of them and have satisfaction in knowing Jesus, there's no need to give away control of your life to drugs or anybody else for that matter. Living a self-controlled life allows Christians to point others to Jesus as they realise the futility of ignoring God. I think that'll do for now. Tim will tell you more next week. So let's just close now with some prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the peace and the freedom that can be enjoyed in knowing Jesus as our Saviour. Please help us to look forward to being taught correctly from your word so that we might grow more useful to you and the members of your church. Please help us to see how we can become better witnesses for you in our homes. And all this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.